Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here this morning. Big welcome to all those who are joining us online. I'm glad you are able to be with us here this morning. Uh, so today, we're going to be starting a new series. And, um, well, in reality, it's really not new. This is a series that I did here at the church back in 2011. So 10 years ago, I did this series. And uh, since I am winding down my time here at Harvest Family Fellowship, uh, you know, we've been talking the last couple of weeks about the fact that January 2nd will be my final day as the senior pastor here. Uh, so since my time is winding down, um, I wanted to do a series that um, that's both fun and meaningful. And out of all the, the sermon series I've done over the years, you know, I've done many over the years, this is by far my favorite. This, you know, if I were to pick a favorite sermon series, it'd be this one. And so I thought I would uh, pull this one out, dust it off a little bit, and uh, we're going to um, get into a new series here. And I've entitled this series, The Facts of Life. The Facts of Life. Now, I know when I mention that, some of you are probably already thinking, oh, um, okay, Pastor Harry, I, I had that talk with my parents a long time ago. We don't need to be talking about that, okay? Or some of you, if you're from my generation, when I said facts of life, then maybe there's a song that came to mind. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. Anyway, so it was a sitcom from the 80s, so yeah, anyway. <laughs> But no, those are not the facts of life that I'm talking about. It has, has nothing to do with it. So when I say facts of life, what am I referring to? What do I mean by facts of life? So I want to start off by defining the word fact, okay? Which I think is a very good thing to define, especially in our modern age today with all kinds of fake news being all over the place. You know, people say, well, how do I know if it's fake news or not? Here's my rule of thumb. If it's on social media, don't believe it. <laughs> Even if you agree with it. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, especially if you agree with it, check it out. Okay? That's, you know, confirmation bias rules. But anyway, that's a little rabbit trail there. So I want to define the word fact. According to dictionary.com, fact is defined as this. Something that actually exists. Reality truth. Something that actually exists, reality or truth. You ever noticed sometimes life is kind of confusing? Oftentimes it's confusing. Probably all of us have found ourselves in circumstances or situations where we didn't know what to do or what we thought was the right thing to do turned out to not be the right thing to do. I know some of you are probably thinking, yeah, you're talking about my ex-husband, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are times that, that we just are confused. And so my goal in this message series is to help you through some of these confusing situations in life by talking about some facts of life, things that are true, that correspond with reality, those things in life that actually exist. And if you learn these facts that I'm going to be teaching in this series and you apply them to your life, I can almost guarantee that your life will not only be much easier, but much more fulfilling. So with that being said, I'm going to move right into fact of life number one. Fact of life number one is this. There is a God. He's not you. There is a God. He's not you. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Pastor Harry, what do you mean by that? Well, I think most of us who are listening today would agree that God exists, right? You know, that's, that's not a question in my life. Um, you know, I have no doubt in my mind that God exists. And if you have any questions or doubts about the existence of God, you know, I'd love to sit down and chat with you, and, and we can talk about that and, and, and discuss the issue. I'd love to do that. But that's not the part of this fact that I want to focus on today. You know, God exists... But what I want to focus on is the he's not you portion. Now, again, I'm sure that all of you are probably thinking, well, of course I'm not God. And intellectually, we all know that. But as the old saying goes, actions speak louder than words, don't they? Actions speak louder than words. 
all too often we act like we are the center of the universe, that the world revolves around us, that it's all about me, too bad for you. And when we think it's all about us, then in essence we make ourselves out to be God. We become selfish, self-centered, egotistical, narcissistic, whatever other word you want to add to that. Self-centered and selfish. And where does that come from? Selfishness, self-centeredness. Well, honestly, I, I think we kind of come by it naturally. You ever notice you don't ever have to teach kids how to be selfish? I didn't have to teach my kids how to be selfish. I've never met a kid yet that you had to say, okay, this is how you be selfish, little Johnny. Okay? No, kids know how to be selfish. You don't believe me. You know, go in the nursery sometime and watch two kids that want the same toy. In fact, there have been times I'd watch my kids grow up and they had like two of the exact same toy. Like they were the same toy. But she had the one that I wanted. I don't want this one, even though this one's exactly the same. And oh boy, the sparks can fly and the selfishness comes. And, and you know, I mean, it's, it's really bad when that happens with, with toddlers. But we kind of expect it. It's not real good when it happens with adults, does it? No. Not good at all when it happens with adults. If you stop and you think about it, One of the very first stories in the Bible is about selfishness. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we're going to be starting at verse 1. Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 6. Let's catch what's being said here in verse 6. She, talking about Eve, she saw that the tree was beautiful, that its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. In other words, Eve wasn't concerned about what God said. Obviously, Eve knew what God said. Eve told the serpent, well, God said, yeah, we can have any, anything we want except for the fruit from this tree. Now, just think about this for a second. There was only one rule in life. Do anything you want, except this one thing. Look at all all this food that's available to you. You can have all of it except for this tree. Now, honestly, I really can't come down too hard on Eve or Adam for doing this. Because quite frankly, if I were to walk into a place that had all kinds of good-looking food all over And somebody said to me, help yourself to whatever you want except this one thing right here. You can't have any of this. Guess what I'm going to want to try? Well, why can't I have any of that? Is it that good? Ooh, yeah. They want to save it for themselves. So, I mean, yeah, I might be enjoying other things, but I'm going to be looking at that one thing. Eve knew God said, no, have anything you want. It's not like there wasn't any food. There's plenty of food, plenty of food. God said, just don't eat the fruit from this tree. Eve thought about what she could get from it. Yeah, God said no, but but I mean the serpent here, he he said that I'd gain wisdom and and I'd know the difference between right and wrong and and I'd become like God and and God said not to, but I mean, man, that sounds like a good deal. 
I mean, to know, to be like God and, and to, to get wise, I mean, yeah, this, this, that would be a big benefit. So, yeah, I guess it's really not that big of a deal. She went ahead and did what she wanted, not what God asked her to do. She wasn't concerned at all about what God said. All Eve thought about was what she could get from it and how it would benefit her. And how did that all work out? Not very good at all. Selfishness has been a problem for the human race since the very beginning. World-renowned pastor Rick Warren opened his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, with this statement. It's not about you. Very first sentence in the book. It's not about you. And those words might sound harsh, but if you stop and you think about them for a moment, there's a lot of truth in those words. We are all selfish to one extent or another. Some people are very selfish. We've all met people that are incredibly selfish. Others, not as much. But we all suffer from it. Let me give you a good example. This happened many years ago when my son Josiah was probably about 10 or 11 years old. We're sitting at the dinner table, and my wife makes this baked chicken that I think they're going to serve in heaven. I mean, it is that good. It's just amazing. It's one of my absolute favorite meals that my wife makes. Like, I can tell, like, you walk in the house, you can tell that that's what she's making. And I walk in the house, and when I smell that, I'm like, oh, Jesus loves me. Because, I mean, it is just that good. And she made that for dinner, and I'm just loving it. I had, had a couple of pieces, and, and every, you know, all the kids were home, and they were all enjoying the meal, and, and there was one piece left. And I'm looking at that one piece, and I want it. Oh, do I want that one piece. But I want to do the polite thing. Because, you know, Mama raised us all to be polite, right? So the polite thing is to ask the question, hey, anybody want that last piece of chicken? And Josiah said, yeah, and he grabbed it and started eating it. And I'm there like, but I did, I don't I, 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 that, was, that was, that was mine. Uh, uh, man, but I mean, what could I say? I, I did the polite thing and asked, and he answered, yeah, I want it. And he grabbed it and ate, I mean, he loved it. And I'm just feeling all bad for myself. I mean, I mean, look, it's not like I was in any danger of starving to death. You know what I mean? Okay. But I mean, all I could think about was like, well, dang, my son took my chicken. You know, it was a selfish moment. I mean, and that, that's something pretty minor. You, you know what I mean? That's pretty minor. But there, there's other, other stories that, you know, another one that, that comes to mind is I'd done a wedding for a couple and, and they had called me about a year or so after the wedding and they were having some issues and asked if I could sit down and do some counseling with them and we're working through some of the issues and, and I kid you, here's one of the issues that came up. The wife, on her way to work one day, hit a deer, okay? And anybody listening online that does not live in northern Pennsylvania, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but where we live, you hit deer with your car. You know, it's not a matter of if you're going to do it, it's when you're going to do it. Everybody sooner or later at some point is going to hit a deer, all right? Well, she hit a deer with her car and totaled her car. She was fine, but her car was totaled, so she had to go out and get another car. You know, so she went out, bought a nice used car. Three days later, her husband comes home with a new used vehicle. He didn't need one. And she's like, I said, well, why did you get, well, she had one. She got one. Why can't I? I'm like, dude, are you 12? <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough when it happens with a 12-year-old. You're 35. You know, I mean, I mean, it's one thing, I guess, you know, if you want a vehicle and you can afford it. And, you know, you, but I mean, I would never buy a vehicle without consulting with my wife. He didn't even consult with his wife. He just came home with it. You know, just not a real smart thing, Okay. But it was selfish. Well, she got a new one. I want a new one too. We love it when things in life go our way, don't we? I love it when I get my way. Now, my way is not always the right way, but I still like it when I get my way. And a lot of what we do in life is done with a goal of making ourselves happy. And again, there's nothing wrong with being happy. You know, I've heard people say, well, doesn't God want me to be happy? Yeah. Every loving father wants their children to be happy. 
But as a, as a, as a dad myself, I, I can tell you that the, the, the state of my children's heart, soul, and mind is way more important to me than their happiness. Like if they can be decent human beings and their heart, soul, and mind is all in the right place and they can be happy, then that's awesome. But if the choice is being happy or having your heart, soul, and mind in the right place, make sure your heart, soul, and mind is in the right place. Because a lot of times we kind of think things will make us happy and maybe they will for a little while. But after a while, it kind of wears off sometimes, doesn't it? You know, you, you, you get a new rinky-dinky doodad, and, and that new rinky-dinky doodad kind of does, you know, does, does it for you for a little while. You're really happy, and, and, but then after or you've had that for a little while, you see another one. And it's kind of like when I bought my last guitar, and I was having a lot of fun with my last guitar. And then I saw a new one, and like, wow, that would, that would be a nice addition to my collection. And my wife said, how many do you need? Really, I don't need any. <laughs> But I got a lot of room on the wall to hang more, so, you know, we run out of room, I guess we'll get a bigger room. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, we tend to be selfish. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, okay, so what? What's wrong with being a little bit selfish? Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, after all, if I don't take care of me, who is? You know? Well, let me pause here for a moment. I want to I want to clarify something. There's a really big difference between selfish and self-care. Let me say that again. There's a really big difference between selfish and self-care. Here's what I mean. Self-care I don't think is selfish at all. If I am not in a good place mentally, physically and spiritually, then I can't help anybody else. I need to be healthy in my body, my mind, and my soul if I'm going to be effective in fulfilling God's plan for me. You follow what I'm saying? In fact, you know, most of you know that I'm a volunteer firefighter. I've been a volunteer firefighter for close to 40 years. And one of the first things that they teach you when you uh, start your training is what they call scene safety. The very first question you need to ask yourself when you come up on any scene is, is the scene safe? Now, here's why. It's really easy to get laser vision on the problem. Like maybe I come upon a scene and somebody's been in a car accident and their car's hit a, you know, hit a, a utility pole and, and it split the utility pole. It happens a lot. People hit it so fast that the utility pole will break. And all I am seeing is the person sitting in the front seat of the car. I'm not seeing the live electric wires draped on the ground. And if I electrocute myself, now there's two patients. And I can't help the person who really needs the help. So I have to be able to take care of myself, my body, my soul, my mind. I need to take care of myself so I am healthy, so I can help others. You know, Jesus said one of the greatest commandments is to love others as you love yourself. If I don't love me very well, then I can't love you very well. You follow what I'm saying? Side the fact, look at the, look at the example that Jesus set. You read through the Gospels and you see often Jesus leaving the crowds and going off by himself. Why? Because Jesus needed alone time with God. Jesus needed some time to recharge spiritually. We also see Jesus taking naps. I love that. Just, what are you doing this afternoon? <laughs> Following Jesus' example, brother. <laughs> you know. Jesus took naps. Jesus took care of himself. Why? Because he knew that he had a mission to fulfill, and he couldn't fulfill that mission if he didn't make sure that he was healthy in his body, in his soul, and in his mind. So self-care is godly. Selfishness is not. Now, a lot of people will take selfishness and they'll call it self-care. No. No, 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 no. You know the difference, okay? If not, talk to your doctor and your doctor will explain the difference to you, okay? You know, there's a difference between self-care and selfish. So let's take a look for a moment at the consequences of selfishness. I am convinced that virtually all of the world's problems are the result 
of selfishness. In fact, I can't right now think of a single problem that is not ultimately the result of selfishness. Maybe there is, but I can't think of one. I mean, think about it. Every kid that goes to bed hungry is the result of somebody somewhere being selfish. There is enough food thrown away every day that could feed all the hungry people on the planet. I mean, especially with the, uh, the ability we have to transport food, there's no reason why there should be anybody going to sleep hungry. But why do people go to sleep hungry? Well, because if they can't afford to buy it, I'm not going to sell it to them. That's what it kind of comes down to, doesn't it? Pretty much every homeless person is the result of somebody being selfish. Just think about our region right here. There's enough empty houses and apartments to house every homeless person. The United States of America by itself could probably house most of the homeless people on the planet. Now, if somebody chooses to be homeless, that's one thing. I, I've known people, that's their choice. But most of the people I've run into that are homeless don't want to be homeless. And there's enough places for them to find a place to sleep. I mean, let's think about it even a little bit more practically. How many of us have a little bit of extra room in our houses where somebody could sleep? I mean, maybe they don't, won't have their own room. But most of us probably, if we knew somebody needed a place, could probably work things out to give them a place to sleep. Most of us could probably feed an extra person or two every day. Oh, no, not all of us. I get it. But most of us probably could. And I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying, let's just think about this. Every broken relationship is the result of somebody being selfish. They want their way. They're not willing to compromise. Or maybe it's both of them wanting their way and not willing to compromise or communicate or whatever. You know, every affair is because somebody's being selfish. You know, you made a vow to, uh, to be faithful to that one person until death do you part. And yeah, I know that vow I made, but wow, they're pretty cute over there. And uh, hmm, yeah, selfishness. We want what we want when we want it, and sometimes we don't care who we hurt in the process. Oftentimes, we see people in the world looking out for only their interests. And in pursuing those interests, they either forget about or don't care about the damage that they are doing to others. And again, let's think about the environment for a moment. There's not a person in the United States right now or in any developed country right now that is unaware of the fact that pollution is bad. We would all agree with that. But over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, you see companies, you know, you see the stories all the time of, of these companies doing horrible things. You know, people dumping frack water out just in a field somewhere. You know, people you know, emptying chemicals into a stream, and they know that what they're doing is wrong, but they don't care because they're saving money. They're being selfish. They're not thinking about the effects long-term of future generations. James addresses this very fact in the book of James, chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, James says this, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, James says, hey, we fight because we're not getting what we want. But then he says, you know, Sometimes we don't get what we want because we don't ask. You know, it's okay to ask God for things. Sometimes, though, we don't ask because we're afraid that God will say no. Or sometimes we know that God will say no. Like, you know, there are things, you know, my parents are sitting right over here. There are things I could go to my parents right now, and I could ask them. I know they'd say yes. 
There's also some things that if I went and I asked them, I know they'd say no. You know, hey, Mom, can I come over to your house this afternoon and eat some leftovers? Absolutely. Mom always wants to feed people. If I ever want a bite to eat, just go to Mom's house. In fact, one time my, my wife was out of town. And the kids were at home. I had to feed the kids. So I had my daughter Becca call my mom. And I told her, I, I told her how to do this. And all you, those of you that know Becca, you know that she could do this well. She's like, Grandma, Daddy won't feed us. We're hungry and he won't feed us. And my mom said, tell your dad, yes, you can come over for dinner tonight. And I went, ha, ah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, mom's always willing to feed, okay? Always willing to feed. Now, if I walked up to them and said, hey, would you give me your truck? No. No, he'd let me borrow it. He's not going to give it to me. Why? It's his truck. If I want a truck, I can go get my own. You know? Well, okay, Randy said, so you don't want a truck. Yeah, every hillbilly wants a truck, okay? And I'm a hillbilly. I, I do want a truck, but I don't need a truck. And my Toyota Corolla is running fine right now, so, uh, yeah. But actually, I don't need to buy a truck because I can always borrow my dad's. So I'll let him pay for the truck, and then I'll just borrow it when I need it. <laughs> But, you know, it says we, we don't get what we want. And we don't, we, sometimes we don't get what we want because we don't ask God. And, and sometimes we're afraid to ask God because we know that God's answer is going to be different than, than ours. And so, well, you know, I didn't pray about it, so it's okay. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do what I want. And, and then we wonder why life stinks. We wonder why you find ourselves in a mess. We wonder why we got problems and issues and, and everything is falling apart. It's because we were more concerned about the moment and what we wanted in the moment than we were about the long term. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I could preach for a couple of hours on that passage of Scripture right there, but Jesus said, you know, look, if you want to be one of his followers, there are times we're going to need to deny ourselves." In other words, there are times that I'm going to give up on what I want to be able to do something for the well-being of the people that I love, for the well-being of somebody else's heart, soul, or mind. You know, there's lots of times we've all done that. You know, how many times have you wanted to do one thing, but then somebody that you love says, hey, would you help me with this? And like, you know, yeah, I really don't want to, but yeah, I love you. I'll, I'll gladly help you with that. You know, like the day my wife asked me, she says, honey, would you like to help me do the dishes? I said, no. I would not like to help you do the dishes. If I would like to do the dishes, I'd be doing the dishes. <laughs> what I'd like to do is just sit here in my chair. But I will help you do the dishes. And she's like, oh, you get over here. You know, but anyway. But it's like giving up what I want to do what God's will is. And, you know, and here's the thing. That deny yourself, it's being willing to deny yourself. But at the same time, I have received so many amazing blessings from God. Anything that I've ever had to give up, I've gotten back in spades. Seriously. I've gotten back, I've gotten it, okay, somebody said spades. That's an old saying, you get it back in spades. I don't know. I guess I've gotten back a lot more than what I ever gave up. Okay? Got back a lot more than what I ever gave up. The Apostle Paul has something pretty interesting to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Starting off the book of Romans, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, I know you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, gee, Pastor Harry, that's really um, interesting. Um, now, as it's written, it doesn't sound very interesting, but the, gospel of, or the book of Romans was originally written in Greek, not in English. And the Greek word used there for servant is actually the word doulos. Dulos. Dulos, literally translated, can mean slave. So Paul is saying, I'm a slave of Jesus. Now, a lot of people say, well, slave, that, that doesn't sound very good. Well, yes, yeah, slavery in and of itself is not a good thing at all. But here's the thing about being a slave to Jesus. It's a willful submission. I willfully submit my will to his will. I willfully, on purpose, I am willing to do what he tells me to do, whether I feel like doing it or not, 
whether it makes sense or not. We willingly submit ourselves to Jesus like a slave, making sure that we're doing what he's asking us to do, not necessarily what I want to do. Jesus will not force himself on us. We have the choice of whether or not we will obey and follow him. I want to go back to Rick Warren here for a second. He had this to say in in his book, The Purpose Driven Life. He said, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. The question that we must ask ourselves, are we willing to submit to God? Are we willing to say, not my will, but yours be done? Now again, our natural reaction would be, well, of course, of course I'm going to do that. You know, and that's an easy decision to make as long as everything's going our way, as long as God's will and my will match up. But as soon as we discover that God's will is different than our own, yeah, it's not so easy, is it? Especially if it's something I really don't want to hear. If it's something I really don't want to do. There have been some times that God has asked me to do things that I'm not comfortable with. But they turned out to be a tremendous blessing. Are we willing to submit to God? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Fortunately, Jesus only has two commands for us. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. To be a true follower of Christ, we must surrender our own will to him. And interestingly enough, it's in becoming a slave to God, to Christ, that we will find true freedom. We really will. Because when I'm focused on myself, I cannot be focused on God. When I put my wants, my desires first, then that automatically puts God's desires second or even lower on the list. And I can't call myself a faithful follower of of Christ and do this. Following Christ is not about what I want. It's about what he wants. Let me tell you, I did not want to resign here at Harvest Family Fellowship. It's not what I wanted. I wanted to stay here till the day I died. God had other plans. And I knew if I stayed longer than January 2nd, things are not going to go well. Because I would be out of God's will. Been there, done that, it ain't fun. So, how can I make sure that I'm not being selfish? How can I make sure that I'm not putting myself at the center of everything? First and foremost, we must check our sources. What do I mean? Let's think about it. Eve was in the garden. She knows beyond a shadow of a doubt what God said, don't eat from that tree. But then she listened to the serpent. That lying, deceiving, scheming, I'm not going to say it because preachers aren't allowed to say that word. She listened to the wrong person. Listened to the wrong source. Well, but Pastor Harry, I'd never listen to a serpent. I hope not. (laughs) But we've all listened to the enemy. Haven't we? I need to make sure that I'm listening to the right voice, that I'm listening to the right source. If Eve hadn't listened to the enemy, she wouldn't have gotten us into such a mess. Check our sources. Just because something sounds true doesn't mean that it is true. Just because something might sound godly doesn't necessarily mean that it is godly. 
The only place we will find out what is always right is from God. If you're not sure, ask God. Open yourself up to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Many times I've said, okay, God, you need to speak to me in a way that there's no doubt that it's you. I'm just not sure about this situation. Please speak to me in a way that I will understand. Now, I know God's voice. I, you know, I, I know how to hear God's voice. But there are some times that God's voice and my voice sound an awful lot alike. So there are times where I'm like, you know, especially if it's something I really want, I really need to ask God. Okay, God, just let me know, is this me or is this you? And when we go to God and, and, and double-check our source, that can help us with our selfishness. Here's another question that I need to ask. Who gets the glory? Does the glory go to me? Or does the glory go to God? Now, both can happen at the same time. It can if I am serving God and in the process do something really well and somebody comes up to me and says, man, Harry, you did a good job. It's okay for me to say thank you. As long as God gets the glory. You follow what I'm saying on that? Now, a lot of, a lot of times I see Christians with some, some false humility. Like, you know, I've heard people say, oh, no, it wasn't me. It was all God. And it reminds me of a story that a former pastor of mine told uh, pastor Rod Murray, he's gone home to be with Jesus now, but um, he was my pastor for a few years, and he was sharing with me one day about how when he was going to Bible school, they had this pretty well-known speaker was going to be at a church not far away from the, the, the Bible school he was going to, and there was a guy that was going to Bible school he became friends with that it had only been a Christian for about a year. He had given his life to the Lord, felt God calling him into ministry, so he went to Bible school. So he hadn't been in church long enough to know all the right and wrong things you're supposed to say and do. So they went to hear this preacher preach, and, and afterwards they went up to him, and, and, and Pastor Rod said, oh, that was a great job. You know, I, I love that message. And the preacher said, oh, it was God. And his friend said, ah, oh, it wasn't that good. Yeah, it was good, but it wasn't that good. You know, I need to make sure that God is getting the glory, that I'm not, I'm not standing up here saying, look at me, look at how awesome I am, look at how great I am. That's selfishness. If I am working in the natural abilities that God has given me, giving him the glory, and I happen to get a little attention during the process, as long as the glory is going to him, that's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be proud of a job well done, but the glory goes to God. If I'm focused mainly on my own glory, again, that's being selfish, and I need to change my attitude. The third question we must ask Am I imitating Christ? Am I imitating Christ? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says if we want to be great, be a servant. Be like him. Follow his example. Because bottom line, it's not about us. It's about him. Think about it. What, what would the body of Christ look like if Christians worldwide stopped being selfish? Imagine what the world would look like if Christians everywhere stopped being selfish and said to God, not my will, but yours be done. I would love to find out what that looks like. But the only way we're going to is if we make that choice for ourselves. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus to be a great example of, of what it really means to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to get our priorities, our, our attitudes, our, our mindsets uh, in the right place. That we would submit to you in all that we do, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would just continue to, uh, to speak to us, to uh, communicate your will with us. Help us to know what it is that you're asking us to do. Give us the courage, uh, the wisdom, the resources we need to follow through on that, Lord. Help us to never be afraid to step out and do your will. 
I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to just continually remember that your ways are better than ours. Help us to follow you in all we do. In Jesus' name.